Today we turn a corner in our exposition of Second Peter as we leave chapter 2 behind and move into chapter 3. Chapter 2, as you no doubt recall, was entirely devoted to the subject of false teachers, their message, their methods, their character, and their ultimate destruction. Given to us, no doubt, so that God's people will be able to identify them when they appear, and so that God's people may be better prepared to resist their influence. Chapter 3 opens a new section in Peter's epistle, and that's evident for a number of reasons, but one is because of the shift from the third person to the second person. Chapter 2 was almost entirely in, in the third person, as Peter talked about them and they and those ones. Now he shifts to the third person as he talks about you, beloved, and what he has to say to you, exhortation and encouragement to you, the beloved, rather than the denunciation of them, the false teachers, in chapter 2. But he does not leave chapter 2 entirely behind, because the words of chapter 3 build upon the teaching of chapter 2, and here in the opening verses, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, we learn how to deal with apostasy, the apostasy described for us in chapter 2 and will be further described for us in some of the verses of chapter 3. But now how we personally should deal with apostasy in our lives. This is not how the church deals with apostasy officially. This is how you and I deal with apostasy, which is departure from the faith once delivered unto the saints in our own day-to-day -day existence. And so our text is verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, and of the Lord and Savior. How to deal with apostasy? Two things primarily. Number one, refresh your minds. Number verse one. And number two, renew your commitment. Verse two. Number one, refresh your mind. I write the second epistle to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Your pure minds by way of reminder. Refresh your minds, first of all, by remembering who you are in Christ. It is not insignificant that Peter opens this chapter with that term, beloved. He didn't use anything like that in chapter 2. But now as he shifts his focus to the people of God, speaking to us directly, he starts out by calling us by this tender, uh, loving name of concern. and It speaks so many things, this term beloved. And Peter uses this four times throughout chapter 3. Totally absent in chapter 2, four times in chapter 3, in verse 1, 8, 14, and 17. Agapatoi. You recognize that word, at least you recognize that it sounds like it, it should be related to the Greek word agape, which nearly all of us recognize as the primary word for love in the New Testament. And that's exactly what you have here. Agapatoi, the loved ones, the ones who are loved with an agape love, dearly beloved, would be a good expression. Loved ones, beloved ones, various ways this could be translated. Beloved in our uh, New King James Bible is, is certainly an appropriate way. I think one of the versions that I generally, that I regularly study from, uh, used the appellation dear friends, and I think that's not quite strong enough. It doesn't rise to the occasion. There's more to it than that. You very much need to include this idea of love, dearly beloved. An address that you find frequently in the New Testament. Beloved, an address that is designed to remind us of God's great love for his dear children and of Peter's tender love and concern for the saints. To remind us that we who trust in Christ are objects of God's saving love and of Peter's tender concern. 
It reminds us of our family relationship. God is our Father. Other Christians are our brothers and sisters, and we are all in the family of God who trust in Christ, and we are greatly loved, the beloved of God, and beloved of one another. Peter loves the saints of God, even as God loves those who are his own. And we respond to the love of God. We love him because he first loved us. And we love our brothers and sisters in Christ because God has loved us and because God has loved them and because God has taught us to love them. In fact, the Bible tells us that we can be no true child of God if we do not love the brethren. Don't miss the subtle import of what Peter is saying. He did not use that term beloved in chapter 2. In talking about the false teachers and the apostates, he didn't say, Now, beloved, you have strayed from the path, and this is a very dangerous thing, and you need to return. He never, never called them by terms that would include them within the family of God because the chapter makes it very clear that they were no true children of God at all. Though, as you recall, they had one time professed to be the children of God. They had departed from that. They had they had renounced the faith. They had left that. They are outside the family of God. They are not the beloved. But you are. All of you who are trusting in Jesus. And it is a reminder that those to whom Peter is writing, and indeed all of those who come with humble and believing hearts to the words of Scripture, to hear these words again that have been given by the Spirit of God, that we are inside the family of God. And the apostates who have left the faith are outside the family of God. And this whole world, this whole world of humanity, some 7 billion people, are divided into two categories. Those who are inside the family of God, millions upon millions upon millions of those who have been bought by the blood of Christ and are included in the family of God and are our brothers and sisters. But there are also multiplied millions that are outside. Where are you? This morning, dear friend, are you truly one of the beloved? Have you come to Christ in repentant and humble faith? And are you clinging faithfully unto him? And so refresh your mind with renewed thoughts of God's great love. Beloved. But refresh your mind, number two, by remembering what you were previously taught. And that's really the main import of verse 1, where Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Refresh your mind by remembering what you were previously taught. These words in chapter 3, verse 1, are a very distinct return to the thoughts that were in the last part of chapter 1 of the same epistle. He talked in the same language. Remember chapter 1, verse 12. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Verse 13. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, this flesh, to stir you up by reminding you. Verse 15. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter thought it was important to remind the saints of God, of the word of God, of the truths which they had been taught. And after laying those Thoughts aside in chapter 1 and talking about the false teachers in chapter 2, he now returns to the very same place at the beginning of chapter 3. It is important for you to remember the Word of God, to remember the truths that you were previously taught. It's not only a return to chapter 1, but it is a return to the first epistle of Peter. He tells us here that this is Second Peter. And he had written previously, 1 Peter. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle. 
in both of which, first and second, I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. And so this tells us we need to, from time to time, go back to First Peter and read that again and refresh our minds about what is in that because that epistle contains important truths that we need to continually remind ourselves of. One of the things that Peter is telling us is that we need reminders more often than we need information. Isn't it true that we know more than we are presently applying in our lives? That we tend to have heads that are full of Bible knowledge and information, but sometimes, quite often, we seem to have trouble recalling it in a practical way to apply it to this particular need in our lives at the moment. And so frequently what we need more than new truth, new information, digging deeper into the Word of God, all of which is very much recommended, and you know I'm not opposed to that because that's a lot of what we do from this pulpit, but much of what we need is to be reminded of the truths that we already know but seem not to have fastened themselves upon our practical daily existence as strongly as they should. Don't forget what you learned before relating to this matter. Don't forget what I told you previously about this. We need to refresh our minds. Not only by remembering who we are in Christ, but also by remembering what we have been previously taught. And thirdly, we need to refresh our minds by conforming all of our thoughts to God's Word. Stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Now you catch in that translation, twice there's a word that, that words that, that are, are related, mind and reminder. It's actually a rather awkward phrase to translate in the Greek. Uh, perhaps the NIV smooths it out a bit when it says, as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Stir up, says Peter. Stir up, a word that means to stimulate, to arouse. The New English Bible says to arouse you to honest thought. Stir up what? Your minds. Put your mind to work. Put your mind in gear. The Christian religion is a religion that requires thought. It requires reasoning. It requires thinking. It requires the use of the mind. The Christian religion is not something that is primarily emotional, though there are emotions that flow from our hearts. We who have been created by God with emotions, there are wonderful emotions that flow from our hearts in response to truth which is apprehended by the mind. And in the modern day, so many Christians seem to want to turn that around and get it backwards and want to try to stimulate emotions, stimulate feelings, stimulate devotion to God primarily by, by way of stirring up our affections, stirring up our emotions, stirring up our feelings. And many times, leaving it at that, stirring that up and as if that's it. Come to church and get charged up emotionally and then go away and live in the strength of your emotions throughout the week, which of course will change as emotions always do. So come back next week and get stirred up emotionally all over again. But Peter has a different concept. He says, stir up your thinking, stir up your minds. He talks about pure minds or wholesome minds would be another translation. The Greek word essentially means unmixed. Your unmixed minds. That is right thinking without any mixture of wrong thinking is really what it boils down to. Probably the closest English word that would describe what he's getting at here would be the word discernment. Your discerning minds, 
Stir up your pure or wholesome minds. Pure minds, pure understanding. What are you getting at, Peter? Well, minds that are uncontaminated by the errors of the false teachers that are freshly on our mind from chapter 2. We've been looking at them and what they teach and how they live and how they deceive and how they work their way into Christian congregations and how, in many cases, they themselves profess to be Christians but have strayed far from the truth. And they are always dropping doubts and insinuations and trying to turn you away from the truth which you have learned. That's why it's so important to keep reminding you, of, reminding yourselves of the truth which you have learned. But pure minds which are thinking the thoughts of God uncontaminated by the false teaching of these apostates and uncontaminated by the world in which we live and not only by the licentiousness which is in the world which of course is a great part of it and is a great battle and we have to continually be fortifying our minds against the filth, the sin, the immorality that is in the world around us but probably that which is even more dangerous to the child of God are the false philosophies, the false religions, the subtle attack upon the Word of God, upon the truth of God's Word that is all around us. If that finds lodging in our minds and ships away at our faith, then we will no doubt fall into lascivious living. That generally follows uncontaminated minds, uncontaminated by those unbiblical aspects of Christianity which have been accumulated along the road of history as excess baggage, sometimes ancient and sometimes modern. The traditions of men don't necessarily have to be old. Some traditions of men are very old and many of of, of modern Christians recognize those very instantly. We don't want any of that. We want something that's fresh and up to date. And many times we are adding the traditions of men, unbiblical baggage to our Christian faith as quickly as we can. As soon as we throw off the old ceremonialism of the past, which is unbiblical, we throw on two suitcases from the present, which are just as unbiblical. Pure minds uncontaminated by this kind of error. Pure minds, pure reason is another way of translating this. Pure reason that is uncontaminated by our senses or emotions. Yes, we are created as beings to perceive with our senses. And everything in this physical world is, is perceived in, by one or more of our five senses. And it is through our senses that we see the, the words on the pages of Scripture. And by, by our eyes we see those, and by our ears we hear the Word of God. But, beloved, we also have to learn to think upon God's Word in such a way that we know how to sort out those, those items of information that have come to us by our senses which are not true to the Word of God. And sometimes that's very difficult because... Spiritual things are spiritual. You can't see much of the truth that is eternal. We no longer see Christ with our eyes, our physical eyes. We see him through the eye of faith. We cannot see heaven. We cannot see angels. We cannot see demons, though they're very real. We cannot see so many of the things that are told us in the Word of God. But all around us, we see many things that seem very real to us because we can touch them. There it is. It's solid. It's real. We can taste them. We can wrap our senses around them. And if we are not very careful, we will allow the things which our senses apprehend to crowd out the things which our spiritual soul alone can apprehend by the work of the Spirit of God. And we will subtly, we wouldn't say this, but we will begin to act as if the things which our senses apprehend are more real, more, more certain than those things which are apprehended only by the eyes of our soul. So we've got to have pure minds that are not contaminated by 
false information from our senses. Anything that our senses would cause us to think is more real than that which God's Word tells us is real, which we can apprehend only by faith. Pure reason. Uncontaminated by group think, by the herd mentality. Every blessing of God can be turned into a liability, a spiritual detriment if we're not careful, because in a sinful world, that's what we do. As fallen sons of Adam, even as Christians, that's what we do. And so on the one hand, there is the wonderful benefit that God has given us in the fellowship of the saints and in the company of other people, particularly the people of God. But that can also become a danger to us. I am amazed at how many people... How many Christians don't seem to be able to accept anything that, that God's Word tells them unless they can find out that their friends believe it the same way too? If my friends believe it, then I'll accept it as so. If my friends don't believe it, then I don't believe it. Ah. Impure thinking mixture of God's Word and human wisdom. And that will lead you off the track. So we need pure minds, pure reason, uncontaminated by groupthink, by herd mentality. It's not only teenagers who are greatly affected by peer pressure. It is adults who are oftentimes affected by it as well. I wonder how many of God's children have failed to embrace wonderful great, gracious, and glorious truths from the Word of God because their friends said, I don't believe that. My friends don't believe it. It must not be so. But the Bible says it, but my friends don't believe it. But the Bible says it, but my friends don't believe it. Now, which way are you going to go, friend? Pure minds. Stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. And that word reminder means more than simply to recall from memory, to recall from mind. The Greek word means thinking or understanding. It's a rare word, actually, not commonly used, not the most common word for thinking in the Bible. But it is used elsewhere, and one occasion is in Ephesians 4.18, which talking about pagan people, Gentiles, who are outside of Christ, it says, having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That word understanding is the same Greek word that you find here. Having their understanding darkened, that is, their, their ability to comprehend spiritual truth is not there. They can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. Their understanding is darkened. Now here's what Peter says. Stir up your pure minds by way of understanding. Same word. By way of understanding. You, because you are born again, you do have spiritual understanding. But you are responsible to stir it up. You are responsible to employ your mind. You are responsible to think about God's Word. You are responsible to reason uh, based upon Scripture. God expects you to use your brain, your God-given brain, now enabled to understand spiritual truth in the way that it was not before you were born into the family of God, and God expects you to employ your brain to apprehend the truths that are found in God's words. You've got to think about them, so stir up your mind. And the report point is that we need to be continually renewing our minds. Isn't that what Paul said in Romans 12, too? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our minds are constantly deteriorating and have to be continually renewed. It's not that we learn certain things and we hold on to them forever 
And if we want to grow, we need to learn more new things to add on to them. The fact of the matter is, if we are not continually renewing our minds with the Word of God, we begin to lose our grip upon those things that formerly we understood. And so we have to be continually stirring up your mind by way of reminder, continually renewing your mind by the Word of God. We refresh our minds how? Number one, by reflecting upon our great privileges in Christ, beloved. Think about that. We refresh our minds how? Number two, by reflecting upon the truths that we have been taught. Don't let them get away. Continue to think about them and to think about them. We renew our minds, number three, how? By applying those truths that we have taught to present situations. There always is the danger of a disconnect between what you believe and how you apply that to your life today. It is amazing how, how we can just fail to apply truth to this situation. I know this about God. I believe this about God. I believe God is sovereign. Then why have you become a basket case because of this little thing that disrupted the normal circumstances of your life? You say you believe that God is sovereign. You, you must believe that he brought that into your life. Why are you acting like life is suddenly spinning out of control? Where is this disconnect between what you say you believe and what is going on in your life right now? Well, you failed to stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. You failed to apply the truths that you had previously learned to this present situation. You failed to think fresh thoughts based upon previous spiritual knowledge. The things you learned yesterday have to be continually applied to life circumstances today. And that requires thought. Stir up your minds. And in that way, you discern truth and dispel error. In that way, you discern God's will for your life. So we're talking about how to combat apostasy, departure from the faith in your life personally. And the first thing is to refresh your mind. And the second thing is to renew your commitment. That is to renew your commitment to God's word. Both of these have to do with the word of God. And notice verse 2, that you may be mindful. There we go again. Mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. Renew your commitment to God's Word, and what will help you do that? Well, number one, remember how God's Word was transmitted. How it was transmitted from God to man. How did we get a Bible? How did we get something we call the Word of God? Well, first there were the holy prophets. The words which were spoken before by the holy prophets prophets, the Old Testament prophets, Peter obviously is referring to, the holy ones, those who were God's prophets, belonged to God, set apart by God, not that they were sinless, no man is, but they were those prophets that God called, God equipped, God spoke to, God spoke through, God spoke to men through his prophets. The very word prophet has the idea of a mouthpiece, a spokesman for God. The holy prophets who spoke the word of God. And this is a reminder of the importance of Old Testament scripture. Peter's writing to New Covenant believers. But he says, remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. The Old Testament still has force and relevance for New Testament believers today. However, it must be interpreted through New Testament truth. And we must, we must understand the Old Testament through the lenses of the later revelation of the New Testament. But nevertheless, let's not diminish the importance of the Old Testament. That's God's word. That came to us by holy prophets. This is how God transmitted his word, his will, his 
character, a revelation of himself. That's how God transmitted that to men, through the holy prophets. But then came an even greater revelation, and that is Christ. Now, this doesn't come out as clearly in my translation. My translation seems to put emphasis only upon two categories, the holy prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. But again, this is a rather uh, difficult phrase to translate in Greek, and so let me give you three other translations, and you'll see that all of them emphasize Christ as the supreme one in this. Now, the New American Standard says, "In the commandment of the Lord and Savior, spoken by your apostles. The ESV says, and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. And the NIV says, and the commandment given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Almost the same thing. And Thomas Schreiner in his commentary says of the NIV that it smooths out the Greek and captures the meaning. So there is, in the original phrase, an emphasis upon Christ as being the revelation of God. And so God first spoke to us by the Old Testament prophets, but has since then spoken to us by His Son, which is exactly what the writer of Hebrews said. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us, by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the worlds. So we're talking about the Word of God. How does it come to us? How did God transmit his Word from God to men? Number one, by the Holy Prophets, Old Testament Scripture for hundreds of years. That's the way God spoke to men. Number two, he sent his Son, and his Son was the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? The Word was God. And God was the Word. And Jesus is the Word of God, the communication of God to us. God gave us His Son. And so now... We have the word of Christ, but Christ went back to heaven, didn't he? So how do we have the word of Christ for us today? Well, then along comes the apostles of Christ. Now we get to the New Testament revelation. How did that come to us? Through the apostles. The commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. And Peter is telling us that the words of the apostles are, number one, as much Scripture as the Old Testament Scripture. The apostles' words are as much the Word of God as the holy prophets of the Old Testament were the Word of God. Now that particular emphasis probably doesn't strike us as being very powerful because we tend to assume that New Testament revelation is actually more powerful, more more likely to be from God than the Old Testament scriptures. And in our day and time, sometimes you have to, to convince people that the Old Testament is as much the Word of God as the New. We've got this idea that there's two different gods. There's the, the God of the Old Testament, and he's different from the God of the New Testament. The Old Testament God was inferior to the God of the New Testament. And the Old Testament scriptures are inferior to the scriptures of the New Testament. But in Peter's day, they knew, these Christians knew that the Old Testament Scriptures were the Word of God. That was the only written Bible they had. When they went to church, and when it was time for the Scriptures to be read publicly from the pulpit, what did they hear? They didn't hear First and Second Peter, well, they might have been hearing First Peter, that, that had now gone to them, and they were just now hearing Second Peter. But all along, what have they been hearing? Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah. They believed that was the Word of God. And so when Peter says the words of the apostles are as much the word of God as the words of the Old Testament prophets, that in some respects might have been a new thought to them. They 
no doubt valued the words of the apostles. They appreciated the words of the apostles, but maybe they hadn't come to think of the words of the apostles as being on the same level as the words of the Old Testament prophets. In other words, that the words of the apostles are scripture, the very word of God. But that's what Peter is saying. He's saying only what Jesus said. When Jesus said in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. We tend to take that verse and personalize it and say that's a promise for me. Only in a secondary sense. It really is a promise that the, to the apostles of Christ, spoken to the, to the disciples of Christ, the twelve apostles of Christ, minus Judas, and a, an assurance that... He the, he, the Holy Spirit, would bring Christ's words back to their mind and that they would be able to recall and to repeat the words of Christ to men after Christ had gone back to heaven. Or this one in John sixteen thirteen. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you, men, you apostles, whom Jesus is talking to, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit not only reminds the apostles of the things they heard when Christ was on earth, but their minds, like ours, tend to forget. So they need to have those things stirred up and be reminded of them so they can pass them on to Christians now that Christ has gone back to heaven. But the Holy Spirit will also teach you new things. The things he hears from Christ in heaven, he will pass on to the apostles. He will tell you things to come. That is, things that Christ didn't talk about while he was on the earth, but will transmit to men through his apostles. In other words, what the apostles wrote, what the apostles spoke, is as much the word of God as what Christ said. And that's why the Bible is authoritative. Once in a while you'll hear somebody say, well, I don't believe the Bible, but I believe the words of Jesus. I believe the red letters in the Bible. Well, Jesus said the words of the apostles are as much red letters as the red letters. They are, they are to be received as such. They are to be considered as such by the people of God. What Paul said, what Peter said, what John said, what the other New Testament writers said are as much the words of Christ as... When Christ said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. We accept that as the word of Christ. Well, accept this as the word of Christ too. This is Christ speaking to you. And this is how God's word is transmitted to men. So remember how it came into the world by the holy prophets and by Christ himself and by the apostles of Christ. And remember how it was implanted. In the Greek, there's that possessive pronoun, your apostles. God brought this word to you, Peter says to his hearers, those he's writing to in Asia. Those who ministered to you, Peter evidently had. Paul evidently had. We saw that in verse 15 of this chapter when we read it earlier. Other apostles maybe had ministered to them. Those apostles who preached the gospel to you with, with the power of the Spirit upon him. And many of you believed in Christ by the preaching of the apostles. They were your apostles. God, God made them your apostles in that way. And they planted your churches. You who are scattered in Bithynia and, and uh, Cappadocia and all the places that, that Peter mentioned there, the pilgrims in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, these, these places where Christians gathered together, where Christian churches were planted. Well, who planted those churches? Your apostles did. The apostles did, but they're your apostles. They planted the church that you are attending, that you are a part of. The apostles, therefore, in many cases, that are known by you personally. Many of you will remember when the apostles were there and preached and established your church. These apostles are yours by providential activity. God in his providence brought you across the path of these apostles and used them to minister 
powerfully to your soul, to change your hearts, to change your life, to birth you into the family of God. They're your apostles. A personal relationship created by God for your welfare. And therefore, they're men that you ought to appreciate, and they're men that you ought to trust. Don't you see the evidence of God in these men? Don't you see that God spoke to you through these men? Don't you see that God established your church through these men? Don't you see that God brought his truth to you through these men? Now, why are you listening to these false teachers? Do their words come to you in life-giving power? No, their words, for the most part, are disdainful and sarcastic and raising questions and undermining. They're not coming to you in the power of the Spirit that impacts your soul, convicts you of sin, draws you to Christ. Just the opposite. Why are you listening to these false teachers? They are telling you to live wicked, licentious lives, and it's okay. You know that's not right. That's not, that hasn't come to you from God. That's not the Word of God. Why are you listening to those men? Listen to the men that God has given to you. Trust them because God has spoken through them. God has given them to you. God has brought you into a right relationship with Himself through them. Now you need to trust them as you continue to walk in your Christian life. And finally, remember that God's Word is authoritative. Commandment, verse 2. Mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. The commandment of us. What commandment is that, Peter? The Greek word, very common Greek word, entele, is used about 60 times in the New Testament, and it almost always means a demand, a requirement. Now, we've come across this before in Peter's epistle and other, other places. There's a brand of Christianity today that wants to extract all of the requirements, all of the commands, all of the duties, all of the thou shalts and thou shalt nots out of the new covenant as if somehow the new covenant is different from the old covenant. The old covenant was full of all of those commands and demands and the New Testament is all just fluffy, duffy love and light and we can just soar and we can enjoy the blessings of God with any, without any of these requirements. No, we soar to a newer level of joy and obedience and loving service, but it doesn't do away with the commandments. And sometimes when our soaring isn't soaring quite as high and we drop back down, we need to drop on those commandments, not just go through them and drop all the way down to earth again, because those commandments, those requirements are what are going to remind us of who God is and what He requires, what is sin and what is righteousness, what pleases God and what doesn't please Him. And there is authority in the Word of God. It is a commandment. But this word, as, as we saw a similar word in chapter 2, is in the singular. It's not commandments, plural. It is in the singular. It is one basic commandment that has been given to us by God. Remember chapter 2, verse 21? For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Well... Peter's just telling us more about that here in chapter 3, verse 2. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment. Okay, so what is this commandment? Well, I will give you a very technical Greek answer that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't read it. This happens to be a double possessive genitive. I, I wouldn't have figured that out looking at my Greek Testament. I'm just am not that sharp in remembering all the nuances of Greek grammar. But Richard Bauckham in his commentators, commentary says, that must mean that the commandment is primarily Christ's, but also in a secondary sense, the apostles'. The commandment is primarily Christ's, but is also, in a secondary sense, the apostles'. 
So that just reinforces what we said a moment ago, doesn't it? The words of the apostles are the words of Christ. But still, that doesn't tell us what this commandment is. But what it is, in short, is the New Testament Scriptures. Don't you see? God has spoken to us in the past by the Holy Prophets, Old Testament. Now God has spoken to us by His Son through the apostles of Christ, New Testament. And the New Testament is described here as the commandment of us, Peter and the others, the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So we've got the Old Testament, and then we've got the New Testament, and it's all the Word of God. And the New Testament is as much the Word of God, the the Word spoken by the apostles of Christ that we call the New Testament, is as much the Word of God as the words that Christ Himself spoke. And all of it is authoritative. One way to describe this body of truth is that it is the commandment. All of it. Matthew to Revelation. Paul used similar language to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 6.14, he said that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. Now, just reading like that, you don't know what commandment he's referring to, and you might say, well, if you'd read a little bit more of the context, I could figure it out. But trust me, when you try to figure out which exact commandment Paul is talking about here, it really turns out to be he's talking about his entire epistle. He's referring to it as the commandment. Keep this commandment. Keep this epistle. Keep this book that I, the apostle Jesus Christ, am writing to you. Keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ return. Now, Peter is saying, in addition to that book, which is the commandment, there is also this book, which is the commandment, Second Peter. And remember the one I wrote first. That book, which is the commandment, 1 Peter, and in fact, all the other epistles of Paul, which are also scriptures, so Romans and and 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, and pretty soon, what have you got? You've got the New Testament canon, the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, that's the commandment. And why does he call it a commandment instead of the love letter of Jesus to us? Well, that's a good title, too, and we can use that sometimes, though you won't find that one in the Bible. But it's the commandment because it's got authority. Yes, it's the love letter of Jesus Christ, and it's wonderful to think about it that way. But that's not the only way we can think about it. Yes, it's wonderful to to revel in the love of Christ. We started out with that. Beloved. Refresh your mind by reminding you of God's great love and remember what all that means, the wonderful love of Christ that found you in your sin and brought you out of that sin and and brought you to Christ and made you a joint heir with Christ. Revel in the love of God. But when it comes to the Scriptures, among other things, don't forget that this, these aren't just devotional thoughts and little suggestions and nice little things for you to consider once in a while. This is the commandment of God. You're going to answer for it someday when you stand before Him. Did you believe it or not? Did you heed it or not? Did you obey it or not? Did you treat it seriously or not? We haven't all heeded it and obeyed it perfectly, of course. Did you treat it seriously? Did you endeavor to obey it? Did you make it your pattern of life? Did you treat it as it was the authoritative commandment of Christ to you, that you as a member of Christ's body said to your head, Jesus Christ, yes, sir, I will do what the head commands. Did you say, as a member of the body of Christ, Yes, sir, I will obey my commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. I will treat His Word, all of it. It is His Word given to us by the apostles. I will treat His Word, all of it, as the holy commandment of God. I live under the authority of this book. We're talking about how to combat apostasy the world is filled with errors of so many kinds 
blatant errors and subtle errors. How can we know what is true? How can we remain grounded in the truth? How do we avoid apostasy? Peter's told us right here. And I can summarize it in these five statements. Number one, by frequent reminders that the Bible is God's word. Number two, by the constant intake of God's word. That's why it's so important for you to be faithful in the assembly of the saints. People who skip church for weeks and months on end are in great spiritual danger. You're not taking in the word of truth. Number three, by regular commitment to its teaching and authority in your life. Number four, by continually renewing your minds with the Word of God, meditating upon it. And number five, by the regular application of old truths to new situations and circumstances. In this way, you fortify yourself. You discern truth from error. You combat those errors that otherwise would deceive you and pull you away from Christ and His truth. Thy word is truth. If you live daily in the light of it, you will not fall. But you let that central truth grow dim, and you will stumble and fall. And some have done that fatally. Shall we pray? Lord God, help us to value your word as it is in truth the word of the living God. To hear it to heed it, to apply it. Help us, Lord, for we cannot do this by ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.